This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. My guest today is Sean Chamberlain, editor of Lean Logic and Surviving the Future, who shares his thoughts about the late David Fleming, author of the material from which these two books were created. Passing away in 2010, David left the manuscript for Lean Logic unfinished. And so Sean has spent the last several years putting everything together, editing, and creating this Dictionary of the Future, an incredible volume at over 600 pages that is the result of a lifetime of research, reflection, and writing on the many topics that we as permaculture practitioners should know something more about if we're going to continue this move from the landscape to creating communities. As you'll hear in the conversation with Sean today, I see lean logic and surviving the future as being a bridge between the early work of permaculture in designing the landscape and in the space that we're currently in of creating the resilient communities that are necessary in order to survive energy descent, climate change, and anything else that we may encounter. It takes us from being individuals working on our own or in small groups to learning how to celebrate together again, how to argue, how to converse, and at the end of the day, to still be friends, family, and neighbors. But more of that after the interview. Here's Sean Chamberlain, including some clips recorded with David Fleming. Then, Sean, can you give us an introduction to yourself and how you came to work with David Fleming? Sure. So for me, I guess it all goes back to 10 years ago. I went down to a place called Schumacher College, which you're probably familiar with down in Devon, for a two-week course called Life After Oil. And teaching on that course was David Fleming, also Rob Hopkins, Richard Heinberg, Michael Meacher, who's a former Environment Secretary in the UK, Ron Oxborough, who's a former chairman of Shell. And for me, it was a real it was a real sort of pivotal, probably the pivotal moment in my life so far. In the last 10 years of my life, I've really flowed from that because I think up till then... I'd really just been researching stuff, particularly around climate change and peak oil at that time, on my own, without any real peer group around it. I remember Peter Lippmann, who's now the chair of Transition Network, saying to me during that course that I had the air about me of a man who'd been wandering in a desert for years and had found an oasis, and that felt about right, really. It was just an amazing experience to find a peer group, and we'd be sitting up till two or three in the morning every night, passionately discussing all this stuff when I hadn't really had anyone to talk to about it before. And in particular, there was, a, there was another student on the course called Ben Brangwin, who I particularly clicked with. And we were both in a similar place of looking to reorient our life to get involved with all this stuff, but not really knowing quite how to do that. And so as each of the teachers came on the course, Ben and I were checking them out to see whether they might have something we could get involved with. And Rob Hopkins at the time had just moved to Totnes, I think a few months before. And so basically he was there saying, look, I've got this this crazy transition idea do you think it might go anywhere based on the work he'd been doing at Kinsale College over in Ireland and uh, and as he was speaking Ben and I were nudging each other saying oh this is this is really interesting stuff and I remember Ben putting his hand up and saying hey Rob if you had say 300 grand to really ramp up this transition idea what would you do with it and Rob said why have you got 300,000 pounds in your back pocket you're thinking of investing and, and Ben said definitely not but I think I might be able to raise it with an idea like this and Ben and Rob, I remember after that, sort of went and went into a corner together plotting and ended up co-founding Transition Network together uh, a few months later. But yeah, I've been at the, in at the start of Transition. And then the next, I think a couple of days later, David Fleming was teaching on the course. And uh, he was the one person teaching on the course who I'd not heard of before I signed up. So I'd, I'd read his work online and in particular a little booklet he'd produced on his idea of tradable energy quotas, which is carbon rationing which is an idea he was the originator of and I'd read this book and I thought well parts in the right place it's never going to work and I had a few reasons for that and so when he was teaching I put my hand up and asked these questions and he started answering and then he got quite involved so we said let's have lunch together and we did and uh, I, over I think two days lunches we got to the point where I thought actually yeah he does have the answers to these questions this is really exciting I'd quite like to get involved with this work and I remember quite cheekily saying to him, so David, I read your book and I had these 
sort of objections, but now talking to you, you've got the answers. But those answers really need to be in your booklet, otherwise other people are going to have the same objections. And also, I think it, it could be better structured, so I actually think maybe I could edit your booklet and improve it. And David was a bit of an archetypal, eccentric English gentleman, you might say, and I just really have this really clear memory of him looking me down and up and this impertinent young man suggesting that he could improve his work and uh, and eventually said, OK, we're both based in London, so here's my card and when you're back from the course, look me up. And uh, when I did, he, he gave me the manuscript for his booklet and I did some work on it. And uh, long story short, he really liked what I did and we ended up working hand in glove, editing each other's work, etc. for the next five years or so until his sudden death at the end of 2010. And then, of course, I, alongside working with David, co-founded Transition Town Kingston in southwest London, ended up writing the second transition book, The Transition Timeline, in 2009. So really, that course, almost exactly 10 years ago, I think it was November 2006, was the start of my whole crazy Fleming transition adventure. Because he's no longer with us, what was David like? I'm an environmental economist, you could argue. I'm a thinker. But the thing is, I do... My speciality is being a generalist. My speciality is of going out... out it's being, it, in the academic world, this is called... It's an extremely long word. Your, your, your tape recorder will probably crash. <laughs> it, interdisciplinary studies, that right. is to say. Yeah. I sort of try to... I cover everything. There's almost nothing I don't include in them. In, in lean logic, which is why it's holistic. taking such a long time. So you're a holistic economist. Yes. And I'm wondering how much work you had to do from these ideas that David had presented to get to this final book and what it was like to work with him and the thoughts that he was presenting. Because what you have between surviving the future and lean logic is just, it's a ton of work. It's an amazing amount of material, just even for one lifetime. As I think is very obvious to anyone who's looked at Lean Logic, it was absolutely David's life's work. I actually just the other day I gave a talk with Rob Hopkins down at Schumacher around the, the launch of the book, and Rob was reminiscing about how how completely inseparable David was from the manuscript for Lean Logic. He would literally always be carrying it and scribbling on it and making notes. And any conversation you'd have, he'd think, "Oh, I have to change that section on the basis of this conversation." And Rob said, even when he came to Rob's wedding, he brought. A, brought a copy of the manuscript and was sitting there <laughs> editing it in the aisles or something. <laughs> so it was quite a quite an obsession for David. And so I think when you ask the kind of man he was, I think in a way Lean Logic is the perfect record of that because it was so much a part of him. And I, actually I think that is why it's ended up being published so late as it were, why he never got it published in his lifetime was, was partly because of his sort of perfectionism and endless desire to improve it. But also, I think, because he put so much of himself into it that the thought of it being published and not really receiving any attention was actually probably, this is speculative, but probably quite a terrifying thought for him. And, yeah, David, as we were reminiscing the other night, he was probably the funniest person I've ever met. He was an incredible conversationalist conversation is one of the key themes as well in Lean Logic, the importance of it and the, the, the fact that it's an art in its own right, as he says, and that was something that that really came through, I think, when you knew David, was the, the joy that it was to be around him and other threads of what it was to know David. I think he was endlessly fascinated by the concept of community. I think in many ways I see Lean Logic as being an exploration of what community is because it's quite a it's quite an abstract and mysterious concept in many ways and the, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people but David was endlessly fascinated by by all the different facets of what community means I remember once he he gave a talk and some earnest transitioner asked him at the end of the talk David if, if there's one thing I could do to really improve the local resilience of my community what would it be and he thought for a moment and he said join the choir <laughs> which I thought was a fabulous answer but that's that's what really comes through in, in, in both books is this emphasis on on culture and on community as absolutely core cool. one of the first things we ought to do about if we really get to understand economics is forget economics altogether but when you ought, ought to be thinking about economics you ought to think be thinking about people thinking about yes our relationships uh, uh, you, 
and don't even think about our relationship. Well, people don't think about my relationship. I have a good relationship with, with Beth on the whole, apart from when she disagrees with me, but she doesn't do it too often. <laughs> uh, but I don't spend, I should be rooting, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about our relationship. We just do it, we just get on with life. And I think the best relationship about that. And I think the, the book, book is all really about getting on with life and crucially getting on in, in, in life with the things that really matter. What, what really matters is music. And, music? Yeah. And, and, and humour and com conversation and painting and the, the arts and, yeah. and things like that. And having fun, play. And farting about and generally enjoying life. That's what really matters. Everything, everything else is just sort of almost sort of a, just a, a kind of... Sort of oh, just sort of, so the, the needle hiss, as we used to say in the old days of gramophone records. Now, you probably are too young to know that, that expression anyway. <laughs> needle hiss. Yeah, no, no needle hiss. <laughs> that is it. It's just, just the foundation. The re most of the rest of life is just the foundation on which what really matters can be built. And what really matters is culture and play and music. No, those are things. I think the other aspect of your question was the sort of the editing process. I think... Yeah, David definitely wasn't great at editing his own work. He was one of these writers who's he has an utterly delightful turn of phrase, and some of the things that would flow from his pen were magical. But I suppose I should mention, actually, that although David and I worked very closely for five years and I would spend a lot of days in, in his flat in Hampstead, which incidentally used to be the office of the UK Green Party, originally was David's flat in Hampstead because he was absolutely at the core of the origins of the Green Party in the UK. He was an early economic spokesman and press secretary for the, the fledgling party, the ecology party, as it was at the time. And so it was quite a storied flat as well in many ways. But yeah, despite working so closely together, he actually never, he would never let me look at Lean Logic because he, uh, he said we were too close, he and I, and uh, he was too close to Lean Logic. And basically, if I didn't like it, we would fall out <laughs> and he didn't want us to fall out. <laughs> And so although we worked very closely on, on my transition book and on his work around this tax scheme, which was taken very seriously by the UK government and many other things, Lean Logic was, I wasn't really familiar with until only, obviously I knew it, he was working on it, but it was only as it turned out about a month, I think, before his sudden death that he said, OK, I think Lean Logic's sort of nearly ready for publication now. And I'd quite like you to look at the sort of introduction and let me know what you think. He'd asked my advice on a couple of more technical sections on peak oil and stuff and climate change. But yeah, so it was only really then that I, I got a first sort of taste of it and absolutely loved what I read and, and fed that back to David. And so then when he passed away at the late November 2010, it was a huge shock at the time, completely out of the blue. He was visiting friends in Amsterdam and um, literally just went to bed one night and didn't wake up. And in fact, in the Netherlands, apparently they don't do it a post-mortem or anything in such circumstances, so we actually don't know what the exact medical cause was. But at the time, we were, we'd just co-authored a parliamentary report that was due out about a month later, and so it was a, a huge shock emotionally, but also practically, to lose my co-author just as we were putting the final touches to this event. And so in the aftermath of his death, and in the aftermath of getting this report out and launched, and that in itself was a huge success, it was covered in Time magazine and Bloomberg News and the BBC and all over the media. But then I discovered the manuscript for Lean Logic on, on David's home computer, and it was like a sort of invitation to one last glorious conversation with him, really, an incredible sort of wide-ranging thing. And the experience that you have with Lean Logic, that it, it's not like a, a traditional sort of author-reader relationship where you're sitting there and someone's lecturing at you. It's much more interactive than that. You're able to steer the conversation, which I think is a, a real reflection of David's philosophy that everything he did was about bottom-up collaboration rather than top-down management. And, uh, and so he's even managed to create a book which almost demands that the reader gets involved in the conversation rather than just passively admiring. Because it was a manuscript that he was actively working on, it was riddled with typos and errors and incomplete sections and links to entries that didn't exist yet and entries that had changed their name and bits that didn't join up. And it was, yeah, it was quite a mess, as you would expect, because he was actively working on it at the time. And actually, his family did self-publish 500 copies of that manuscript, just as it was when he did under hardcover in 2011. So if people are interested to see Lean Logic literally as he left it, then that is available on uh, online, leanlogic.net, I believe. But then you know, it was very obvious that this was a book which deserved a, 
a sort of a, a real publication. And so I spoke to some friends in publishing, and the feedback was, you know, it is an amazing work, but it's it's huge and it's very unconventionally formatted. And is it really going to find its audience? And maybe we need some kind of gateway, some kind of more conventional or shorter version. And so with a few of David's close friends, started looking at how that might work. And we actually went through and scored, I think out of five, we scored all the entries in Lean Logic as just completely subjectively to get a sense of you know, which did we all agree were highlights that we really wanted to find our way into this, this shorter work. And then once we had that, we started looking at what might, by this point, really I started looking at the, how the structure might work and how it might fit together. And then actually the editing work of tweaking these various entries so that they made sense in a more linear structure. And there was to some extent a kind of hesitation in sort of straight jacking, Dave, straight jacking David's work into a linear form, because I do think part of the beauty of Lean Logic is the unconventional format. But at the same time, I hope it's a sort of gateway drug that people find it a bit more accessible, but it's a way of getting hooked on David's beautiful writing and charm and then hopefully wanting a bit more. But yeah, it has been, I would say it's been about somewhere between two and three years full-time work to turn David's last manuscript into these two finished books. So it's certainly not been a small thing. And it was interesting, actually, I, I because I've been on a sort of book tour over the last couple of months, the first event I gave was a workshop at the Dark Mountain Festival here in the UK. And I was really unsure how to do a workshop around Lean Logic because it's so wide ranging. I felt what I focus on is going to give the wrong impression of the book. And so what I did in the end was get people to just shout out any topic at all, regardless of whether they knew anything about the book or what it might be about, just any topic at all. And I would read an entry from Lean Logic that spoke to that, just to give a sense of how utterly wide-ranging it was and that sort of worked quite well and I think got across the sense that this is this is a choose-your-own-adventure book in many ways and of course Surviving the Future the paperback is the adventure that I've chosen if you like it's my sort of personal meander through Lean Logic and I, I took care to include a lot of things a lot of sort of references and things in there that are like I'm only mentioning this in brief but if you want more on it then you know go to Lean Logic and the feedback I'm getting is really positive it seems like Surviving the Future does work as a standalone book, which is something I was really... It was very hard for me to judge, having started from Lean Logic. But yeah, I'm hearing that sort of works. and But a lot of people actually are finding it nice to read Surviving the Future with Lean Logic on hand so that they can follow a set path, have a guide, if you like, but also wander off down, <laughs> down little into snickets if they want to. And I came to this because I received Surviving the Future first from my contacts at Chelsea Green. And I had explicitly requested both of the volumes because it was when I saw the upcoming catalog, I was like, these two together are something that I really want to dig into. There's something about this that speaks to me. And so I received Surviving the Future, and that's where I really started with it. And I'm thankful that I did because I don't know if I had received Lean Logic first, that I would have been ready to read Surviving the Future when it came. And I love the format of Lean Logic. But without the understanding that Surviving the Future laid out, I think it would have been something that became more of, as it's subtitled, it's a dictionary for the future and how to survive it. I think I would have turned to it when I was looking at certain issues within permaculture to see if there was an entry for it. Whereas in reading Surviving the Future, it really piqued my interest to read Lean Logic and to have a copy in my personal library because I really find that David's work and what you've done as the editor to create this companion volume has really created something that bridges the gap between the heavy work of permaculture in the landscape. In particular, it's I think it's chapter 14 in Bill Mollison's Designer's Manual talks about how we can create a culture for the future and lays this groundwork. And I was fortunate enough in interviewing David Holmgren, he talked about how he and Bill had wanted to do more with the social and economic structures, but never returned to it because of how much of the landscape work there was to do. And one of the things that I keep coming back to is that for permaculture right now, many of the landscape questions are, have really been answered. We know how to grow regeneratively. We know how to build food forests, and we're learning more about savanna ecosystems and jungle ecosystems all over the world. So we're finding out how to grow the food that we need to create permanent agriculture. 
but we don't necessarily have the knowledge and really the skills to create the permanent culture then to provide for community in a meaningful way. And I find that what David provided and what you've worked with then to create these very accessible books really bridges that gap to get us from permaculture to transition. And I think that between having Mollison's Designer's Manual, Holmgren's Permaculture Principles and Pathways, then Surviving the Future plus Lean Logic, and then the two volumes on transition, that we have a complete six-book series on how to go from the landscape to our communities. It's a shame, isn't it, in fact, that Bill Mollison obviously passed away recently and that he won't get to encounter Lean Logic and we won't get to hear what he might have thought of it. But we'll certainly have to find out what David Holmgren thinks of it. Actually, I recently sent a copy, so as you'll be aware, the title Lean Logic is partly inspired by this concept of lean thinking. And I, uh, I was, got in touch with Dan Jones, who's one of the two creators of lean thinking on Twitter, and he asked me to send him a copy, which he has, and he's saying he's absolutely fascinated by this book. And uh, he said he never dreamt that, apparently he's read himself quite a lot around sort of alternative economic structures and social structures, and he never really occurred to him that lean thinking could be applied in the way that David does. And so he's, he said he's very busy at the moment with a book of his own, but his first priority when he finishes that is to sit down and read basically all of Lean Logic and then get back to me on it. So it's very interesting to find these thought pioneers, are probably many of them encountering David Fleming for the first time as well. And yeah, no, we'll have to make sure David Holmgren gets a copy, definitely. And it's very, I'm very glad to hear what you said about the relationship between Surviving the Future and Lean Logic, because as I say, obviously, from my point of view, it's very hard to get a sense of that, having had such a different relationship with the creation of the two books but it's interesting reading Jonathan Porritt's foreword to Lean Logic and I did an event with him last month at Oxford University around the books as well and I didn't really realize Jonathan Porritt was saying that David Fleming was a real mentor for him as well and uh, really shaped a lot of his green thinking and reading his foreword he talks about how Lean Logic which he's very familiar with and he'd never seen Surviving the Future at the point where he wrote this foreword he talks about how lean logic can be quite confusing in a way because it's because it's daunting and it's like being thrown into this big wood and said find your own way through it kind of thing and so in his foreword Jonathan lays out what he sees as a kind of a core structure as a kind of a bit of a guide to how you might find your way through the book but increasingly I'm realizing that yeah surviving the future is providing that it's taking what could be a very overwhelming work in lean logic and providing a, a sort of cohesive coherent this is what the core vision is so that people can grasp that without having to read the entirety of lean logic which is something i suspect a limited number of people will do because it's not really a book that lends itself to sitting down and reading it from page one to page 500 it's much more of a read the bits that interest you and follow your own instincts surviving the future is a book that i really want every permaculture practitioner to read one person in particular who comes to mind whose thoughts I'd like on this is Toby Hemingway, because he's one of my favorite folks to talk to because of just the way that he thinks about these things, especially with his most recent book, Permaculture City, because of our concentration into the urban environment now and also addressing some of these formerly unaddressed externalities about what it means to run to a piece of land while still being connected to civilization. And just in... Surviving the Future, it's something that's really compatible with permaculture. A lot of the work that's going on now within the permaculture community is a conversation about how do we really get into creating the future that we want that's beyond the landscape. I won't say that it's a huge number of people who are talking about it at the moment because so many people's entry point is with gardening, but the socioeconomic structures that we need to address are something that I feel is deficient within the permaculture conversation right now because so few of us come from those backgrounds and surviving the future and what you've distilled down from what David provided in Lean Logic really provides a way for us to look at these things openly and to have some principles and some ideas that we can work from in order to create something that is hyper-local that really meets the needs of the people there. And one of the things that really stands out for me is that idea of carnival. It was something that, as a child, it was we always went to the local carnivals, and very often they had amusement park rides and a midway and food and things. But that's where you would go to see the rest of your community members. 
And I stepped away from that for a number of years, but now the township where my children live, we have all of these community events throughout the year where we come together, and one of them is that kind of amusement-style carnival, but we also have just regular community get-togethers. Let's celebrate this thing. Let's celebrate something else. And I never thought about the ways that all of those could integrate together into really building a bioregional community culture and to be able to celebrate together and to look at it in a way that isn't economic. Because like with our local carnivals, those are all provided for through a local social organization and they don't need to make a profit from it. They can just throw the money at it based on the resources of what they've raised and they do it as a community good. I think this is what David lays out really. It's, it's like a it's like a non-economic economics, if you want. It's it's economics without all the associations that, that word brings with it. The fact that you know, it has this re- real frustration, I think David felt, that just that word economics seems to make it seem impenetrable and even boring when in fact it's the very thing that shapes the majority of our working lives. It decides what we work at and for how long and who with. And yeah, he's managed to lay out answers to our economic questions, which are just really engaging and personal and communal rather than mathematical and abstract. And we tend to think whenever if we talk to most people about this, they would say, come on, pull the other one. This is not realistic. But actually, we also need to recognize how crucially important the informal economy already is now. And most of the thing, what we're doing right now is in the informal economy. We're not getting, not, not, not getting paid for this. Our family life is informal. All our friends are part of the informal economy. Most of the things with people in art of that kind of light life do a part of the informal economy. We do things for each other constantly, all the time. And if I were to do something, if I was to do something for a friend and they were to offer to pay me, I would be mortally insulted. That'd be more or less the end of <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, we tend to think, oh, to come off in the informal economy, this is terribly romantic, uh, unrealistic. On the, on the contrary, it's a very unrealistic to dismiss the, important, the informal economy as being, as being unimportant. So it's going to be a, 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 a big rediscovery of the, inf- the, the informal economy. But it is very hard to summarize. <laughs> but how does it, okay, the, you're doing a lot of research about how things have worked and how, th- and you've obviously got ideas about how things could work. We've got this whole financial system. Are, you're talking about replacing that with something else? No, unfortunately I'm not. I don't think it's going to last. I, I think a lot, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm a bit of a, a right winger to, to most people's horror and shock. And so I think in many ways, the system we've got at the moment is really is not a bad system. I think capitalism is a good thing. The only problem with capitalism is that it destroys the planet and that right. it, it's based on growth. And apart from those two little details, it's got a lot to be said in its favor. Yeah. And when capitalism dies, we'll be on our knees. We'll, be, we'll wish it was back because it's a, it supports a, a high standard of living. It supports freedoms. We're, from the point of view of freedom, we're an incredibly free society. And mm-hmm. that is basically to, to do with the, the, the capitalist system we've got. So it's a wonderful system in, in a way. It's very efficient. It's based on pull. It's not based on authoritarian people telling other people what to do on the whole. It's based on people in, uh, ask, asking for services, paying for them. So in many ways, it's got a lot to be said in its favour. But you've got the absolute, yeah, there's no such thing as a free lunch. It's got these absolutely crucial flaws, which is the, the essential flaw is it depends on and 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 it will go on it will go on depending on growth to the point at, at which it which it collapses. I, it's not necessarily an argument against a system that it collapses because most systems do collapse in the end. That's a part of the nature of the wheel of life. The systems do collapse and there is life and death. So I think. I'm to some extent slightly inclined to forgive capitalism for being about to collapse. There are lots of fine things, you know, lots of love affairs and, which have, have come to a sticky end, and lots of novels which come to an end, and life tends to come to an end. I mean, life itself comes to an end. You can't necessarily blame life for being something that comes to an end. So I'm not really going to blame capitalism. On the other hand, it does. It's, it's quite, quite a thing to be held with, you know, quite, quite an accusation. It's hard, hard for it to live down, the accusation that not only is it is it based on on the ludicrous idea that growth can continue indefinitely, but it's going to destroy the entire planet with it. I mean, that's quite a lot. That's a big problem. That's a big. It's not. It's not a small problem. It's a fairly <laughs> sort of fundamental yeah. pro- problem. Then. But anyway, the thing is, the thing is, as uh, it is going to hit the buffers in, in, in this way, we don't have to you know, go around uh, destroying things. We don't have to dismantle the banking system and, and such things. But whatever we do with the banking system, it will make absolutely no difference at all. We do not have to change, reform things. I'm not a reformer. I don't think we should bother. We should waste time reforming things. It's going to reform itself in that it's going to come to um, falling about our ears very quickly indeed. And indeed, the longer we keep the system going, in some ways, you could argue, the longer we keep the system going, 
the longer the growth will continue until the greater will be the fall when it eventually happens. The more nuclear power stations will be able to build, the more forests will be able to cut down, the greater the CO2 accumulations when eventually the crash happens. So there is something to be said, actually, for the crash being earlier rather than later. And I think that's a real part of the beauty of it. I remember when we were deciding what should go on on the, the back cover blurb for Surviving the Future, and we were really unsure whether to use the word economics or not, just because, on the one hand, it absolutely is about an alternative economics. On the other hand, as soon as you hear that word, you expect something so abstract and dry and tedious <laughs> that it seemed quite misleading. In so many ways, these books are so hard to categorise because they're something genuinely radical and new based on a, a fundamentally different paradigm. Actually, this is something that Jonathan Porritt really picked up on in our talk in Oxford, which was that one aspect of what's exciting about David's work is that it, it's about a post-economic growth vision, which we're really lacking. I mean, as Jonathan said there, there's no mainstream political party in the world that doesn't base its sort of vision for better lives on endless economic growth. And yet, many people understand indefinite growth on, on a finite planet is madness and impossible. So we, at some point, are going to have to acknowledge that and, and figure out how to deal with it. And the problem is, David acknowledges very strongly in, in the books that right now the end of economic growth means the end of the market economy. And that means incredible suffering because the we don't have an alternative to fall back on. So he could never really get very excited about degrowth as a concept because degrowth is about degrowth of the market economy, which in many ways means the end of the market economy. Whereas what really excited him was growth of what he termed the informal economy or what a lot of people call the gift economy, which is exactly what you're talking about, the community and the reliance on each other rather than on money. And what's, I think, really refreshing about David's work is that as well as maybe it's worth an aside, that I'm told by Jonathan that he first met David in the 70s when they were both involved in the early days of the Green Party. And David was urging his peers to, uh, to learn the language of economics because he said, it's the economists who keep telling us that all this stuff we're talking about with our ecological systems thinking is rubbish and not well thought through. So we need to engage with them on that ground. And he was as good as his word, and he went off and got a PhD in economics. But he always saw that as a tool for engaging with economics as a sort of adversary, if you like, of mainstream economics rather than as an insider. But as well as his economics training, he was also fascinated by history. And we were at Oxford because that was where he he got his degree in modern history. And I think it's very exciting that these books are not David saying, I've got this brilliant idea as to how we save the world. They're much more about him saying, this market economy, this growth-based market economy has only been around for a couple of hundred years and it's already running up against its own inherent buffers. So let's look at what sustained humanity throughout the vast majority, the vast majority of human history. And he argues very convincingly, I think, that this is what it was. It was this informal economy. It was villages, it was communities, it was culture, it was carnival. And all that we're doing is not having this brilliant new idea about this transformative transformation in society that we need to see, but just going back to the only system that's only ever actually worked historically. Do you have a rewilding or a primitive movement? Yeah. Obviously, George Monbiot, you're probably aware of his work. So he's based over here and writes weekly for The Guardian, one of our big papers, and he's been the sort of lead advocate for rewilding over here. And also the Dark Mountain movement, which I think is probably less well known in America, but you might be familiar with it. And so Dark Mountain, really the idea there, it's another movement I've been quite involved with from the outset, and the idea there is that Dark Mountain is really looking at the questions we feel we're not allowed to ask in polite society. Like looking at climate change, for example, there's this sort of overwhelming cultural agreement seemingly that you're not allowed to despair you're not allowed to say oh well, maybe it's all too late and maybe we're not going to head this off and maybe we're not heading to a brighter future but, and that it can actually be really exhausting pushing that down all the time and that dark mountain was really a space that was opened up in part as a way as a place where people could actually talk about this stuff not just in a we're doomed way but what does life look like in a for example a, a scenario of runaway climate change because we're still alive and there's still choices to make and there's still love to do and there's still projects to undertake in that world. But if we're never allowed to actually even acknowledge that it's a possibility, despite that most of us think it's quite a high probability, then, then 
that's a sort of problem culturally. And so Dark Mountain, yeah, is a space, and it's a, it's an artistic and cultural space. It's a journal of, of write, creative writing and art that explores that stuff, and actually was one of the one of the keys to Lean Logic getting published because I submitted some extracts to uh, to one of their issues. The principle for the issue was post-cautionary tales. They said, we've heard enough cautionary tales, now we want to know about what happens after we ignore the cautionary tales. <laughs> and I thought, that is the first category of any kind that I've heard that Lean Logic actually fits perfectly. <laughs> and so I felt obliged to submit some extracts, and I did, and they loved them. And in fact, they ran them, they asked for another set for their next issue. And it was in, I think it was Dark Mountain Book 5, that Chelsea Green Publishing found these extracts and got in touch to say, wow, what's this book? Maybe we could publish it. And yeah, Dark Mountain played a little role. And I mentioned them because I know a lot of the people involved with Dark Mountain are very keen on this kind of rewilding and this sort of a neo-primitivist. And I bring that up to establish a baseline because there's a big rewilding movement, especially in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States, but I also have friends throughout the country who were involved in this as a human rewilding. And they're asking a lot of really big questions about what it means to have culture and community and what really works because humanity existed in cooperation with the natural world for hundreds of thousands of years and it's only been in the last 10,000 or so that we see this rise of hierarchy and structure and a movement further and further away from gift-based economics. And in our conversations, we all are continually moving this bar of where we would like to see things go. And some of us joke about wigwams with Wi-Fi to keep the things that we do like and to get rid of the things that we don't. And that's where I like what you've done here, is you say, is that kind of like post-growth economics, is as much as I don't like the language of economics because of how much I feel that it turns everything into a monetary equation. And I have a friend who's right leaning on the American political spectrum who's but pretty much everything that drives the world is economics. And we had a back and forth about it, and we agreed that it's not necessarily money, but it's capital of some kind. And that if we can agree that it's capital, then it doesn't necessarily have to be financial capital. And one of the theorists and authors who I like is the libertarian socialist writer Murray Bookchin, who's now since passed, but that we've had this drive over the last 40 years or so to talk about everything in economic terms that we're investing in our children. And I like the way that what David was doing can use these economic terms, but they're being approached in a way that we can use this kind of common parlance to discuss these non-monetary ways of addressing these issues. No, absolutely. We were talking before the interview about this concept of economism, which is one of his entries in the dictionary, and he says about the, uh, this is this presumption that matters of public policy can be interpreted mainly or completely in terms of economics, and, and particularly in terms of these abstractions, which he says in one of the entries in the book that most economists learn their economics through these sort of scale model economies, if you like, which deal in, for example, only two kinds of product that everyone wants to buy. And unfortunately, he says a lot of people who learn in these scale models find it very difficult to actually leave them and go and engage with the real world. And so they spend their whole time building these these sort of scale models and then pretending that they actually approximate to what's going on out there. And uh, yeah, that's right. There's a, 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 the entry on capital, in fact, in Lean Logic is a, particularly, a particular favorite of mine where he lists, I think, six different types of capital and all the very, very different characteristics that there are between them. And for example, that one of the more shocking concepts, I think, to a lot of ears is that he talks about intentional waste. And you think, well, surely waste is something we want to cut back on. Surely we can agree on that. But actually he says, not really, because there are some kinds of capital that inherently grow, grow and grow and can grow to the point where they destroy everything else. And those kinds of capital, it's very important to waste them, actually. It's very important not to let them just grow and grow until they destroy everything else. And that by whatever, you know, by instinct or by wisdom or by whatever, it's only in the last couple of hundred years that we've thought that the wise and sensible thing to do is to conserve this capital and store it up and grow it and build a whole economy based on compound interest. And that in fact, you know, wasting this stuff in all the various beautiful ways that one can use up capital, like building cathedrals is one example that he uses. This can actually be a very wise thing to do because if you don't find some way of using up this capital, it consumes everything else. And and gets to the point we're getting to now where people even think that the word capital just refers to money. 
one of my permaculture colleagues when I was taking my PDC had a background in economics and finance. And one of the things that he presented on was this, as you mentioned, that we can't just continue to grow forever. And he referenced that the only thing that we know of that grows forever kills you because it's cancer. And being able to have some real conversations about where we go next. And one of the things that really moved me in David's work was when he was talking about externalities. And so often the conversation about externalities are the negative externalities, the kinds of things that we want to mitigate. Yeah, like carbon emissions or whatever. And when we talk about cell phones and things like that, it's the damage that they're doing to the environment. And it was the first time that I've ever heard about positive externalities. And looking at if I'm spending more at my local grocery store and getting to know my grocer, that's a different relationship than if I'm going to this large multinational chain and spending my money there. I might be saving a little bit of money, but where is that money going? What is it doing? Who is it helping? Yeah, and as the example that he uses, I think, is maybe a local shopkeeper will keep the keys for your daughter while you're out, and your local supermarket's not going to do that. And those kind of externalities aren't, we don't think of them as being in the price, but when that local store's gone and there's no one to keep the keys for your daughter, then we suddenly realize what we've lost. And it's been some of the conversations that have been going around in some of my peer groups recently is about some of these really big box stores that we know are incredibly destructive and extractive. And one of the things that I like about permaculture is that in many ways it's judgment-free because it's about making the best decisions that you have with the resources that are available. And so does it make sense to go to one of those big box stores knowing what they are doing, but also understanding that the people who work there come from your community? And so by shopping there does support someone in the midterm while we're working on other long-term plans and projects and goals in order to help support them outside of that environment. But we just don't have that now. That's right. One of of my pet hates about our sort of mainstream society is that it always seems like whenever I learn something new, I find out that the default option I'd been taking was the worst possible one. It's like when I was looking at opening a bank account as a young man I sort of thought okay everyone seems to think I should go for the one that pays the best rate of interest and so you open a bank account with your default bank and then you find out later what they're investing that money in and you suddenly go you think bloody hell I need to <laughs> I need to change my bank account or you go to the you go to the local shop and you think well, okay I'll buy the cheapest tastiest food and then you find out oh my god what am I supporting with that and yeah it is just this great frustration of our current system that it seems like all the default decisions are the most destructive ones. <laughs> all the ones that you take when you haven't really thought it through, when, you, when you're when you a bit tired or you just need something quickly, they're always the destructive ones. And what David's talking about is rebuilding a, a society in which the easy default decisions are the ones that actually support a healthy future for everyone. And support... Uh, I think what's really important in David's work is that he doesn't just talk about environmental sustainability or even economic sustainability he's really talking about cultural sustainability that there's a wonderful line in one of the reviews from jeremy leggett who said he doesn't shy away from the uh, the problems that we're storing up for ourselves but really his book isn't about what we could lose it's about what we could regain that we've lost already and i think that's a really important point about his work it's i find it the most the reason i put years of work into it is because i find it the most compelling vision of the kind of future i'd like to build that I've come across. It doesn't just engage me at an intellectual level where I think, yes, that really makes sense and I'd really like to see that happen. It just makes me think, God, yes, yeah, that's the life I want to live. Let's get on with it. And that, I think, comes out of the cultural element, which, as you say, has been maybe the missing link between a lot of the great work that's out there. And what I like about this, the world that we want to have from this and moving back to some of these values that we would like to have is that it's presented in a way that is not nostalgic. It's not baseball diamond in every community and games on every Friday night. It's accepting that we've gone somewhere and done some things to get to where we are now that includes all this technology and all this science and research and ideas, and yet it's how do we take that and use everything that we do have to make the world that we want rather than trying to tear it down and return to something that is really just myth. Yeah. David was actually quite... He didn't have very much time for people who talk about let's bring down civilization because he thought if we do that now we've got nothing else to rely on if we didn't have this centralized market economy then we're going to really struggle and i think that's very obvious to most people and his argument was we don't really he was of the opinion that this economy 
is going to collapse over the coming decades. And But he didn't feel that, that was you, you necessarily had to agree with him on that to go along with his strategy, because what he was saying was, let's rebuild this informal economy, this skilled economy, as fast as we can. And if there is no collapse, then great. That's the kind of world we want to live in anyway. If there is a collapse, then, oh, my word, we really need to do this because it's going to be the only thing we've got there to rely on. And I think that's quite exciting in a way. And I think part of the reason why I haven't seen any real right-wing, left-wing divide in terms of fans of the book yet. There's a a British philosopher called Roger Scruton who is very associated with right-wing thought here. And he didn't know David, but I, I noticed that he was referenced a fair bit in in lean logic and so i sent him a copy of a draft of lean logic and he absolutely loved it and wrote a very glowing blurb for the book at the same time someone like caroline lucas the head of the green party here or john holloway the sociologist really really excited and engaged with this work and i I think you're right it's because it's not saying let's go back to some glorious past but neither is it saying let's you know, tear down what's here now. What it's saying is, let's take the best of what's here now and learn from the past, learn from the things that we do, and create something much better in the future. The government is still thinking about incentive schemes right. uh, because they say that you know, people, <coughs> they, they, <coughs> people will that won't, won't actually do anything unless they're treated like donkeys with a carrot and a stick. Actually, we've got we, we're not donkeys, and if we're, and we're treated like donkeys, then we'll behave like donkeys. If we're trusted to do something, you know, which is actually which works, that is, if we want to do, then the thing is completely different. And lean logic is, to a very large extent, based on that. It's saying, actually, it, it's treating human beings with respect, the people having mm. imagination, to use your word, and intelligence and judgment and motivation. And what we're doing is unleashing, the great unleashing that I'm interested in, is unleashing the imagination of people so they can get on and build their own future, which I think is, I think, a lot of people are prepared to do, and the transition movement is an indication of how prepared they are. And there we ended with David Fleming to bring the first interview with Sean Chamberlain about this work of lean logic and what we can do to survive the future. And Sean and I do have an additional interview continuing this conversation and looking more towards Sean's current work and the future of permaculture, transition, and to building the communities that we need. And as I close, I'd like to thank Jamie Bright for helping me to produce this episode and to integrate those clips from David Fleming. I really appreciate that work. And for everyone who continues to help make this show the incredible success that it is, for everyone who tunes in and listens when a new show comes out, it's good to know that you're creating a more beautiful and bountiful world. Take care.